So let's jump into it. This course is thermodynamics. It's the first course in a two semester sequence of thermodynamics. Well, thermo means something hot, thermal, heat, and dynamics, something move, motion, typically rotary. So when you see thermodynamics, the origins of the word go back to burning something to turn something. Burn to lift, burn to push, per, burn to you know, combust to do something useful to do work, so a heat engine. Uh, this first chapter is introductory concepts. I encourage you to really not just slough it off like, oh yeah, I've seen that before, but really master the introductory concepts. Just go through and just carefully make sure that you can solve all the problems and that you understand all the principles because what I found even when I teach Thermo 2 is that some students have some flaws in their understanding and mastery of concepts all the way back to chapter 1 or chapter 2 or chapter 3 of this book. And yet here I am trying to cover something in chapter 8, 9, 10, and it's very difficult to remediate those problems. So spend some time in this first chapter. There's a lot of topics. Let's jump into them. Everybody here is user of electricity. We're benefiting from the use of electricity with the lighting in this room and with the air conditioning in this room. So where does that electricity come from? Well, thermodynamics is a study of energy and the forms of energy and the transformation of the energy between forms. And so one of the end uses we like to think of is beautiful electricity to make lighting and to provide electricity to run compressors for chillers and uh, refrigeration systems and air conditioning systems. Well, in the city of San Antonio, we have CPS Energy. It's a municipally owned utility. It provides electricity and natural gas, so we should know something about where we get our electricity from to service the buildings at UTSA and apartments in this vicinity. Well, CPS Energy produces and sells that electricity. How do they generate that electricity? Well, probably at least 40 to 60 percent, somewhere in that range, is produced by coal, burning coal. We truck in a lot of coal, train it in, you know, not what, it's not with semis, it's with long coal trains to come in with Wyoming coal and it's per burned in a power plant like Unit 1. They have a, both t Unit 1 and Unit 2 of the Spruce power plant located at Lake Calaveras in San Antonio and they have about 600 megawatt electric. That's a pretty good sized coal fired power plant. And uh, we get, I would say again, about 40 to 60 percent per year of our electricity is generated with coal. How does it work? You burn the coal to boil the water. The water goes through a steam turbine. We'll analyze turbines and heat exchangers to rotate or turn a shaft to spin the electric generator to make the electricity which is then put out through the grid. Nuclear. Do we get any electricity in the city C CPS? Does it generate any nuclear, you know, have any nuclear generate electricity? We're using electricity in this room. Uh, about a third to a little bit more than a third averaged over the year that you use in the city of San Antonio and Bear County on this campus, UTSA, is generated via nuclear power. Over a third. Think about that. Really? Where does Lake Calaveras have a nuclear power plant? No, that's down there as coal. But let's talk a little bit about uh, nuclear for a minute. So you have nuclear fuel rods in a reactor that control would control the fissioning process, breaking up those nucleus of so the uranium-235 element typically is the one that's being fissioned for heat. You have a primary coolant loop so that that water stays separate from a secondary coolant loop which goes outside the containment structure, large concrete huge thick containment structure to then drive steam turbines out on a pad outside the containment structure to drive a steam or electric generator to sell the electricity. After it passes through the steam turbines, it goes into a condenser to condense and don't go back to the steam generator inside the containment. So you have a primary loop, secondary loop. Part of that has a condenser in here 
And we don't have a large concrete cooling tower. We have a big lake at our power plants in the state of Texas. And so it's lake cooled. Well, where is it down here? It's down here is South Texas Project. It's located very close to the city, Bay City. A number of UTSA grads are working there currently, have been for a number of years successfully. Uh, very productive engineering degrees. Um, that plant is co-owned by three large utilities. I think it's Reliant or a different name out of Houston. So most of it, or 50 some percent goes up to Houston area. Uh, about uh, 40 percent goes to San Antonio. That provides about one third of the electricity used in the city of San Antonio from that power plant. There's two reactors at that power plant. So we have one site with two reactors running. One can be down, one can be up. They're huge, they're 1,280 megawatts each, okay? And the other one is city of Austin. City of Austin owns it as well, but they own only about 15, 16%. The rest is a little heavier toward the Houston utility than the San Antonio utility. So that's the two reactors at the Bay City site at the South Texas project. Notice that even on Google Maps here, you can see the size of that lake. It's a 7,000 acre man-made lake just for the power plant, for the cooling. And they pump it out of the Colorado River that flows right nearby. And no, I'd love to go fishing on that lake myself, but it's restricted access. The whole compound's very heavily armed restricted access, so you can't get on but it's a great wildlife sanctuary, crocodiles and birds and everything else. Well, you may be from the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and they have uh, two reactors at the Comanche Peak Nuclear Re uh, Operating Station near Glen Rose, Texas. And they are very big as well, 1,250 megawatt electric each. And they provide to, what is it, TXU? Who's from the Dallas, Fort Worth, TXU? Utility up there, I think they're the ones who own it. So they pump up into the Dallas, Fort Worth area. This is the type of clicker question I have. This is the type of multiple choice on the final exam. This has been on the final exam verbatim, just like this. It says, how many nuclear power plants are currently generating electricity in the state of Texas? Four reactors at two geographic sites, four reactors at four sites, eight reactors at four sites, eight reactors at eight sites, or no nuclear power plants are currently operating in the state of Texas. And it always bugs me that even though I may have emphasized it, there'll be some students, uh, they're clueless, and they'll select E. It's not E. What is it? A. It's A. See how easy this class is going to be? <laughs> this is easy. Easy. Aircraft. Uh, San Antonio has some aircraft-oriented industries. One is Standard Aero, uh, down by Kelly USA. Uh, they basically are repair and overhaul the T-56 turboprop engine, which drives the uh, C-130 aircraft. Now, it's a vintage, it's an old aircraft, but it's still in use. It's huge in the military. And so they have one, two, three, four of those turboprop engines, T-56s, which are serviced in San Antonio. Number of UTSA grads are working at Standard Aero, have worked. Number of students have worked. Maybe some of you have a summer job opportunity or are employed at Standard Aero in that work. So and in this class, we're going to study a little bit about gas power cycles that basically describes how a jet engine works. Oh, C-130 military aircraft uses what type of engine for propulsion? Turbojet, turbofan, turboprop, turboscrew, or turbo mock? Air conditioner. Uh, how many people never been in a car that's air conditioned, never been in a house or apartment or even a building that's been air conditioned? You would be hard to imagine our life today without air conditioning in Texas, true? How about refrigeration? No cold beverages, no place to store food to keep it cold. It would be hard to imagine how important 
refrigeration, air conditioning are into your life. So there's a company called Train. Maybe you heard about it. Train? Maybe? Yeah. Yeah, they do a very good job of marketing. Uh, they have a lot of advertisement. There's a lot of name recognition. They have a facility up, I think it's in Whitehorse by Tyler Longview area that is a compressor manufacturer facility. I know one at least UTSA grad that's uh, career is up there. He's working. Um, so people end up into this line of uh, work. How about Goodman? Goodman. How many people, you know, maybe more hands went up for train. How many? There's one for Goodman, two for Goodman. Where is that company located? Where is the headquarters of Goodman? Headquarters of train is in La Crosse, Wisconsin. It's a little bit away from here. La Crosse, Wisconsin, but uh, what about Goodman? Houston, Texas. Goodman doesn't put as much emphasis on advertising, but they have a large part of the residential air conditioning market, a large part of it. So there's a lot of other manufacturers, but I think they have a 15 to 20 percent share of the residential air conditioning uh, market. And they're located, headquartered in Houston, with a large manufacturing facility in Houston. So, again, it's hard to imagine life without one of these, but uh, uh, we study the vapor compression refrigeration cycle, which is the backbone of air conditioning systems, as well as backbone of food preservation, like in refrigerators and freezers. Here's another one. This is a room air conditioner. What's the name of, right here on the... Friedrich, uh, that's the Cadillac of room air conditioners, really is. Friedrich has been the standard by which is the best high-end uh, window unit. Where are they located? Where's their hometown? Right here. How long have they moved in? A few years, 1883. <laughs> They had over by the Pan Am Expressway off of 35, about 10 years ago, they had their manufacturing. But under the international pressure that all manufacturers experienced, guess where they moved all their manufacturing to? Mexico. Mexico. Which makes a lot of sense because so many people are bilingual. You can easily have engineers working and going down to the facilities. I think it's in Monterey is where they moved all the, and I could be wrong, somebody could correct me, but it was about 10 years ago that they moved the manufacturing out of San Antonio to Mexico, but where their headquarters, they recently moved them over near the airport. They're still, I would say, the premier uh, developer of room air conditioners, and there's still a healthy market for those. Chillers, this is a big device. On this campus, there is no refrigerant in this building. They bring in pipe in chilled water, put the air across it to make it cold air to then provide the air conditioning in this room. Now that chilled water isn't so cold anymore so it goes back to a central energy plant where it's chilled. And what does the chilling? The chiller. How do you like that? Engineers aren't that clever with naming, are they? <laughs> so it has at least four pipes to it. One is you've got to finally dump the heat to the atmosphere so you have a loop go up to the cooling tower, but you have a, a loop going to and from the buildings. So when you first look at the chillers, it's a little overwhelming. I can't figure it all out. But we'll understand the basics, vapor compression refrigeration, typically not with a reciprocating or a scroll, but with like a screw compressor for these large, uh, or centrifugal compressor for these large chillers. Well, why did I show this one? This is manufactured by York. We have a number of these large York uh, chillers on campus, probably about six or seven of them. Where do you think they're made? Actually, in San Antonio, has a large manufacturing facility. If you go on I-10, going out towards Seguin, right after you hit 410, right? Go south, one more big exit. It goes toward China Grove. I forgot the number, 87? 78, what is that highway going out to China Grove? Come on now, come on, you're from San Antonio, some of you are. Anyway, it used to have big York plant, blah, 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 but then they got bought out by Johnson Controls, and now it says Johnson Controls, but they still make the chillers there. A certain range of chillers are made uh, in, in San Antonio. Well, hopefully that got you fired up because 
there's nothing worse than why are we studying this, right? We study this because this is a backbone of a lot of mechanical engineering careers and in industries that employ uh, mechanical engineers. And so a lot of what we study affects your life. That was hopefully what I was able to convince you. It's like, yeah, this is important. Also, to show you that uh, people do have careers which there's no ad for a quote-unquote thermodynamic engineer. I've not seen one ad like that. They want to hire somebody who specializes in some piece of equipment like heat exchangers or compressors or some device, vapor compression refrigeration systems or refrigeration engineer or some propulsion system or materials or something uh, with, with the component like that. But, but believe me, a lot behind a lot or at the foundation of a lot of industries is this, this, this uh, topic of thermodynamics. It's a foundation. Okay. Well, let's jump into some more dry material, but it's not too dry, hopefully. We, when you're studying thermodynamics, you have to be clear about where your system is, the focus of the study. That's what the system is. How many people remember statics and remember free body diagrams? And the instructor, didn't they say something about get the free body diagram correct? If you start applying your mathematical relations, like some of the forces in the X have to equal to zero for equilibrium, but you don't have everything on the free body diagram, you're not going to get the right answer, right? Same thing here in thermodynamics. What is the focus of your study? What exactly is your system? And then distinguish the system by a boundary, separating it from everything that's not in the system, which is the surroundings. So we could focus on a quantity of matter. That would be a closed system. Or we could focus on a region in space where there's flow in and flow out. That would be an open system. But you have to be very clear about your system. The boundary is often distinguished with what type of line? A dashed line. And it needs to be an enclosing loop. Do an enclosing loop. Sometimes we have a piston sliding back and forth in a cylinder. And we'll study piston cylinder apparatus ad nauseum almost. You'll, you'll get expert at it. And the focus of the study is the system, which is the material trapped in there. That system could be an ideal gas, could be steam, could be some something, some fluid, syst fluid. but that system could change in uh, volume as the piston slides back and forth in the cylinder. So a closed system can have work transfer across the boundary. What do you mean? A shaft that's rotating with a torque in it. That would be work is being uh, transferred across the boundary. It also could have heat transfer across the boundary. What motivates uh, heat transfer? Something hot and something cold. So you're going to have a heat transfer from hot to cold. But a closed system, the key is the mass is constant. The energy of the system can change with time from initial to final state. Also, if this is a closed system in a piston cylinder, not only the, the energy can change, but the volume can change, the pressure change, the temperature change, a lot of other things. Sometimes our closed system, that piston cylinder apparatus, has a boundary that moves so that piston can move up. So if it moves up from state one to state two, what did the volume do? Increased. Did the mass change? No, because it's a closed system, but it has a movable boundary. What about the temperature? How did that go up? Well, maybe you had a flame to heat it up. So the temperature could have changed. Even though the boundary uh, expanded and so I have more volume, you could have added a lot of heat to temperature rise. And then here, what, it, what, what about the pressure? Well, in this case, the pressure stayed the same. The pressure stayed the same. Maybe the weight of the piston didn't change, and the piston's frictionless, and it can just slide up and down, and the weight doesn't change, hence the pressure doesn't change. Somebody wants to change it up, and this is the, the difficulty in thermodynamics. 
All you do is change the problem a little bit, and then the engineer or the student has to really figure out how to solve it. Let's say I put a rigid surface up here, and then I had a little spring. Well, what happened to that spring from state one to state two? It compressed. Now you have the weight of the piston plus the force of the spring pushing down. Do you think the final pressure will still stay 200 kilopascal, or do you think it'll go up? It'll go up. It'll go up. Okay. So there's ways of mixing up the problem to make it a little more interesting. Why do we study piston cylinders? Because of the backbone of internal combustion engines. And so what's happening is you have a piston sliding back and forth in a cylinder. And up here you may have valves to open and close it, but we'll talk about how we do a simplified analysis where we just leave those valves closed, and what we're doing is the auto cycle or a diesel cycle. Late in the semester we'll understand those gas power cycles, and we're just making a very simple model for how the internal combustion engine would work. So we don't put in the spark plug. We kind of throw that out in our simple analysis, but the spark plug is needed in the real engine. And then uh, hopefully everybody understands how the internal combustion takes that translational motion of the piston moving back and forth, seems kind of simple and almost boring, and converts it into rotary motion of the crank, having an offset and a connecting arm. True. How many people, I would, one time I did a couple surveys, I said, you want to be a mechanical engineering major? Yes, I do. Okay, well, why didn't you pick electrical, civil? You picked mechanical. And then typically, it's not like over 50%, but the one answer that gets the highest percent response from students, maybe about 25, 30% of the students say something about automobiles, engines. Usually that's, usually the number one is like automobiles and engines. Uh, motivated me to choose as my major mechanical engineering. I wonder what made you choose your major in mechanical engineering. Was it automobiles? <laughs> what? I think somebody was talking. I didn't hear it. Well, this would be a, a simple um, uh, illustration of what we call a nozzle. We use a lot of nozzles inside of devices to help speed up flow. So the mass flow rate coming in and the mass flow rate going out may be the same, but because the smaller cross-sectional area for it outgoing, it probably is going to go out fast. And probably there's a high pressure to push it through the nozzle to make it go out fast. So it goes from high pressure to low pressure, and it's going to go in low velocity and go out high velocity. You're, you're going to do an energy balance, low kinetic energy, high kinetic energy. Well, we would use an open system analysis for this. So our dashed line still enclosing a volume, would indicate the focus of the study, and we would have mass flow rate in as well as mass flow rate out. Sometimes you'll have an isolated system. Well, that just means not only no mass transfer, you have no heat transfer, and no work. There's no communication between the system and the surroundings. So if the system undergoes a process from initial state one to final state two, the isolated system, the energy is conserved. Um, these words, I mean, it's sometimes it's a little embarrassing even to explain it. Like, isn't this pretty obvious if somebody says it's isolated, what that means? We're out of time already? Thank you very much for your attention. We'll see you later.